Although the term small arms ammunition normally includes calibers below 60 or 6 tenths of an inch, ammunition for the 20 millimeter and 37 millimeter aircraft cannon is included in this subject for convenience. Each ammunition box arrives from the manufacturer with both written and color identification on the front and back. The 50 caliber tracer is designated by a yellow and green diagonal stripe. The 50 caliber ball cartridge with a solid red stripe. The 50 caliber armor piercing with a yellow and blue stripe. This color identification system is also true of the 30 caliber cartridge, except that the stripe is vertical instead of diagonal. Also, all ammunition boxes are marked with the number of cartridges contained, the arsenal from which they came, and the lot number. When the ammunition supply is received at the storage depot, it should be immediately sorted according to caliber and lot number, and stored in a dry place. To keep ammunition boxes and their contents dry, they should be kept from coming in contact with the floor or ground by the use of dunnage. This provides an airspace beneath the boxes, which should also be provided between each tier. Canvas covering, if available, should be used even indoors to protect against possible roof leaks. For outside storage at an ammunition dump, it is very important to see that the dunnage is sufficient to keep water from reaching the boxes. Secondly, an airspace should be provided between each box to allow free circulation on all four sides. Airspace is also provided between successive tiers by placing additional planks on top of the lower boxes before the next layer is stacked. For protection from weather, canvas cover should be placed over the stack of ammunition boxes and tied down securely. These covers will act as protection against the direct rays of the sun and from the rain and snow. The covers for the 50, 30 and 45 caliber packing boxes are fastened with wing nuts. A seal placed on the box by the arsenal must be broken before the lid is removed. The hermetically sealed inner liner or ammunition container found inside the box may be opened by grasping the handle provided and exerting a strong pull, tearing back the metal. If the container has been sealed exceptionally well, and will not respond to a hand tug, a board inserted through the handle should be used as a pry. To open the 37 millimeter packing boxes, the seal on the hinged hasp must be removed first. Packer's certificates and the loader's designation will be found in each ammunition packing box. The metal inner liner is opened in the same manner as shown in previously opened boxes. Twenty 37 millimeter shells are packed in each box and are separated from each other by individual wooden partitions. The box containing 50 caliber ammunition holds 300 cartridges packed in 30 cartons of 10 rounds each. Unused cartridges of a certain lot number should be returned to the boxes of the corresponding number. The box containing 30 caliber ammunition holds 1500 cartridges packed in 75 cartons of 20 rounds each. The box containing 45 caliber ammunition holds 2,000 cartridges packed in 100 cartons of 20 rounds each.
12 gauge shotgun shells are packed in an ordinary wooden box without the inner liner. A box holds 500 shells packed in 20 paper cartons. All these ammunition cartons are lightly constructed and are very susceptible to moisture. Although ammunition packing boxes are ruggedly constructed to carry the heavy weight they contain, they should never be dropped, but should be set down easily and evenly. By dropping this packing box on its corner, the damage that a very slight fall can do to a wooden box is clearly demonstrated. The weight of the contents makes even these rugged boxes easily broken. Care must also be observed in stacking the packing boxes. Rough handling like this may easily open the seams of the metal inner liner and admit moisture into the box. If the box is left in the rain or under a leaky roof for any length of time, water may accumulate on top of the inner liner and eventually find its way through the breaks in the inner liner seal caused by rough handling. Condensation which accumulates on the liner as a result of temperature changes may also find its way inside the liner if the box has been roughly handled. Any moisture which enters the inner liner will be absorbed by the cardboard ammunition cartons. Eventually this dampness will corrode the brass cartridges to such an extent that they will be worthless. The functional effects of moisture in powder may be readily demonstrated by placing dry and damp powder side by side and igniting them with an electric current which heats both simultaneously. The ignition delay produced by the moisture is at once apparent. Moisture which has collected on the cartridges may gain entry to the powder through damage to the crimping which holds the projectile in the case. Also, rough handling may loosen the primer to such an extent that moisture can gain entrance between the primer and the cartridge case. These corroded cartridges are a very good example of the extended action of water or dampness on brass. Obviously, the hard corrosive crust on the cartridges renders them useless as ammunition. Cleaning the cartridge adequately cannot be done because the corrosion has eaten into the case, pocking the metal. This renders the cartridge unserviceable for use because it will not fit properly in the weapon's firing chamber. If this corrosive action is allowed to continue long enough, the mouth of the case will split down into the neck and shoulder of the cartridge. Obviously, such ammunition is worthless. Partially used boxes of ammunition which are to be replaced in storage, should be sealed with friction tape along the broken edge of the inner liner. This is an effective temporary seal for the ammunition's protection. An identification tag should be fastened to all broken lot ammunition before it is returned to the box. This tag should bear the lot number. Further, the number of cartridges written on the card found in all ammunition boxes should be corrected to read the exact number left in the inner liner and the box. Cartridges should at all times be protected from dirt and foreign substances, as dirt and gritty deposits may cause the gun to misfire or jam, perhaps with disastrous results. Any dirty ammunition held in links or belts or clips should be removed to be cleaned. In no instance should cartridges be polished or oiled, as this may also cause the gun to jam. When possible, empty cartridge cases are salvaged and returned to the manufacturer for resizing and reloading.
small arms ammunition group is limited to a maximum projectile diameter of six tenths of an inch. The 50, 30, and 45 caliber cartridges are the most commonly used of that group by most ground and air forces. The 50 caliber cartridge is adopted as the modern standard for heavy machine gun fire and is the most effective of all small arms ammunition when employed against opposing aircraft, bomber, pursuit, or interceptor. The 30 caliber cartridge, although practically obsolete for aerial use, is still the standard for ground forces and is also effectively used by aircraft for ground strafing. The 45 caliber cartridge has a very effective striking power at close range and is therefore used for close in defense and attack. The 50 caliber ball cartridge has a plain unpainted projectile tip. In peacetime, 50 caliber ammunition is packed in cartons, 10 rounds to the carton. During wartime, they are issued in belt links. Different cartridges are filled with different cores. 50 caliber ball bullets contain a soft steel core. The 30, as well as the 45 caliber, is filled with antimonial lead. The armor piercing cartridge has a black projectile tip, which classifies it immediately as armor piercing even when separated from its container. The core of the armor piercing projectile leaves the jacket when striking armor plate. The core of most armor piercing projectiles is made of manganese molybdenum steel. It has a lead slug in the tip which with the nose of the jacket acts as a starter for the armor piercing core when striking armor plate. As it hits, the jacket with the leading lead slug crumples and folds back, partially melting with a rapid fusing action after making contact, the armor piercing core continuing through the armor. During peacetime, Tracer ammunition also comes in cartons. The standard wartime packing is in metallic belt links or fabric machine gun belts. The tips of tracer projectiles are painted red. Here, the tracer composition has been removed from the jacket, but clearly it would fill half of the projectile. The tracer is preceded by a solid lead ball which fills the nose of the copper jacket. The 50 caliber tracer will burn for approximately eight seconds. In actual firing, the tracer composition is ignited by the flame of the propellant powder. The purpose of these tracer projectiles is to enable the gunner to direct the spray of bullets upon the target. This action is particularly valuable to aircraft gunnery, where fighting is done at high speeds. The 30 caliber cartridge, except for size, is essentially identical with 50 caliber ammunition. This is true of all types. The 45 caliber ball and the 45 caliber tracer have the same general construction as the 30 caliber ammunition. The ball carrying a solid lead slug in the jacket and the tracer having a lead slug preceding the tracer composition. The 45 caliber tracer is distinguished by a red tip. The tracer burns for a comparatively short time. The cases of the 50 and the 30 caliber cartridges are more narrow at the mouth than at the head. That is, they have a neck and shoulder. The neck is thinner than the rest of the case and is of springy brass which allows it to expand during firing and to contract after the expulsion of all propellant gases. During manufacture, the cartridge is waterproofed with an application of varnish.
Then, when the projectile is inserted, this varnish plus the crimp of the mouth fitting into the cannelure or groove of the projectile prevents the projectile from coming loose during handling. In rifles or machine guns, the igniting of the propellant is accomplished in this manner. The primer is fired when struck by the firing pin, which pinches the igniting mixture between the brass cup and the anvil. A flame is thus produced, which passes through a vent hole in the body of the case. This flame, in turn, ignites the propellant. The copper alloy jacket of the projectile is soft enough to allow the rifling of the weapon's barrel to cut grooves into the jacket, rotating the projectile and creating a centrifugal force in flight that prevents wobbling or tumbling. The softness of the jacket also allows the metal to fit tightly enough against the walls of the barrel to prevent the propellant gases from escaping ahead of the projectile. The rifling cuts are deep and definite, demonstrating how tightly the jacket fits into the barrel. In the use of all small arms ammunition, three very definite factors should be considered. Cartridges should never be oiled. From a mistake such as this, high pressures or desensitizing of the primer may result. Secondly, if cartridges in links or clips should become dirty, they should be removed from the links or clips for cleaning. Thirdly, during combat or range firing, there is great danger of rebound or ricochet. This is true of all types of ammunition, though especially of armor piercing when complete penetration is not accomplished. The danger area may be assumed, depending upon varying conditions, as a 200 yard radius from the object. Naturally, no fast rule for rebound or ricochet can be arrived at, as there are too many erratic factors. However, this danger should be seriously considered when the gun crew or other friendly troops are within this area. On land or in the air, your security depends on your ammunition. Use it properly and it will serve you well.